261, Away in the Manger, number 261. by me forever and love me, I pray. How the human heart desires to be loved, and what great love God has given to us in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and how he stays by us always to fit us for heaven, to live with him there. Oh, pray for the children, pray for the children, that they might be saved and that they might live for Christ. How oh, I pray that for my children and my grandchildren, and if God should give me life for great-grandchildren, that they would be saved and fit for heaven, to live with him there. At Christmas time, we do remember our Lord Jesus Christ coming as a tiny infant, that he might be our Redeemer, our Savior from sin, the one who paid for every wicked thing that you and I have ever done. He paid for it all. Do you know that for sure in your own heart? Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left its crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. We're looking at the fourth part of the names of God today. We saw it declared to us in Exodus chapter 3 verses 13 through 15 a few moments ago where God declares his name I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am, hath sent me unto you. And as we moment, mentioned a moment ago, God has not only declared his name audibly to Moses and to others throughout the scriptures, but he has given his name to us in the scriptures themselves. 
But last week, you recall, we also saw that the name of God is declared in multiple other ways. God has declared his name through his glory and power displayed in nature. In Psalm 8, which is designed specifically to tell us that the name of God is declared in nature, the very first verse, the very last verse of that nine-verse psalm tells us, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. It speaks of the newborn babes. It speaks of the heavens. It speaks of the stars. It speaks of the moon. It speaks of the angelic beings. It speaks of all the creation we see around us, the sheep and the oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. God will declare his name. And that is why the Apostle Paul tells us that the invisible things of him, speaking of God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. As we live in a society of pagans, it is our responsibility to point them to the creation because the creation stops every mouth. The creation declares that there is a God. The creation declares that they are without excuse for he has revealed himself through creation. The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. All of the heavens are heard. They have a voice that speaks to every place on the face of the earth. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world, in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of heaven, his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. As you study creation, it more and more makes you stand in awe of this magnificent God who made these things. Instead of taking for granted the plants that grow, the sun that shines, complaining about the rain that falls, as we study what God has done in creation, in this one tiny, unique point of dust, in this monstrous universe, how God has suited it precisely for man to be able to live here in this place and to give him glory. And how God, who, who came to this tiny little portion of dust in the universe as a man, because there was one part of his creation that was in rebellion against him. And he loved us so much that he gave his son. That's what we remember at Christmas, the incarnation of God the Son. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name, is thy name in all the earth. The creation declares the glory of God. And as we saw last week, those first six verses of Psalm 19 are followed by the declaration of the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. As we look at that second half of the psalm, it is exactly parallel in verses 7 through 14, how God's law declares his wisdom and righteousness, purity, enlightenment, judgments, warning, holiness, and redemption. Let me add a few thoughts that we did not cover last week. I had briefly talked about why the Bible commands us to study creation because last week was our creation conference in the evening. 
But let me give you a few additional reasons. The first of those reasons is that the study of creation, the study of the world that God made around us, is part of the dominion mandate that God gave to Adam. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. And that mandate has never been rescinded. Let me read it to you. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Folks, that's immediately preceded by the dominion mandate. To have dominion over these things. God has put all of creation under the hand of man. How can we as Christians ignore that? Our responsibility to it, our understanding of it. You know that if you would take care of your children, you must know what their needs are. You must understand them. Those children are made in the image of God. Each of us has a responsibility. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion. That is part of the dominion mandate. Dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Our fail failure to get engaged with this because we say, well, we don't need that. We just need faith. Our failure to be involved with the world around us seeds it over to the pagans who very well have taken and manipulated and twisted the truth so that they now are able to deny God. They worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever, Romans 1, again. Dear friends, we do have a responsibility in this area. Job also makes it clear that if we would really understand God, notice this, Job, by the way, is probably the oldest book of the Bible. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, but Job lived before Moses. Moses records the history that had gone before him in Genesis through Deuteronomy. But Job probably lived sometime around the time of Abraham, or perhaps a little before that. And he tells us and makes it clear that if we would really understand God, and how God fulfills his plans, we must study the creation. These verses I'm about to read are a command. Notice that. Job 12, verses 7 and 8. But ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee. And the fowls of the air and they shall tell thee. Or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee. And the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee. Not only the heavens declare the glory of God, that's astronomy. That's the study of interstellar space and all that's in it. But here Job is telling us to study the animals, the birds, the fish, the earth itself, that's geology. And they will teach us about God and, I might add, the impossibilities of evolution. We saw that if you cannot answer the challenges of those who would infiltrate the church and destroy the faith of believers, and pull the children into the philosophies of the world, 
you are disobeying the command of 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. When you understand who God is and what he has done in making the creation, it will give you a spirit of meekness. It will give you the spirit of the fear of the Lord. That's the fear that he's talking about here in 1 Peter 3.15. The book of Proverbs tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the holy is understanding. It also tells us the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Some will say, but all I need is faith. Well, certainly the Bible says, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And I have no argument with that. We take that on faith, that God created something out of nothing. Evolutionists say something came out of nothing all by itself. The Bible says, we understand that the worlds were framed. God made the worlds out of nothing. And by faith, we do believe that. But you know, as we look at those words, we understand their context too. Faith is all that is necessary for salvation. But that faith must be faith in the Christ of Scripture. And the Christ of Scripture is the Creator. In the brief meditation that I gave last night at the beautiful Handbell concert, we used as our text John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. And the opening verses of John chapter 1 present Jesus Christ as the Creator. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. That takes you back to Genesis 1. And the life was the light of men. And the very first thing God said was, let there be light. And then we get down to verse 14. And the word, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word was made flesh. That's the Christmas season that pulls us back to creation. Jesus Christ, the one who made us, is the one who came as a babe to redeem us from our sins. Dear friends, if you would have the Christ of Scripture, you must have the Christ who is the Creator. Because it is to the Creator that someday every knee will bow. And that's at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. Of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's at the name of Jesus. Remember we're studying the name of God. How the scripture ties together from Genesis to Revelation and every book in between, the historical books, the prophetic books, the books of wisdom, the gospels, the epistles, the book of Acts, it all ties together around the name of Jesus Christ, the one to whom we must someday give an account. Yes, all we need for salvation is faith, but it must be faith in the Christ of scripture. Now, suppose a sincere believer comes up to you, and there are those out there who have believed what the Word of God says. They have trusted in Christ for their salvation. 
They are on their way to heaven. Let me ask you a question. Do you know any believers, truly saved Christians, who believe stupid things? I think we can all smile and answer yes to that. Do you know any believers who believe things that are inconsistent with what is revealed in Scripture? And I think we can all say yes to that. We have many co-believers who are in other camps, denominationally, who believe things that we don't believe. They will be in heaven just like we are. Because they've trusted the Christ of Scripture. But they do believe some things that are wrong. Has it affected their lives? Yes. If you think about all the doctrines of Scripture and what it means to believe certain things concerning the sovereignty of God, for example, as concerning the so-called free will of man, do those who believe in the sovereignty of God have a greater settled peace in their heart knowing that their God will never fail them and that they will be eternally secure versus those who are, for example, of an Arminian persuasion who believe that they can lose their salvation and get it back and lose their salvation and get it back and lose their salvation and they just hope that they've got it back at the moment of death. How insecure is that? What you believe, people, will affect the way you live. Yes, there are some believers who believe things that are wrong. Do they believe? Do they have faith? Do they believe the Bible? They say they do. But what kind of agitation does Satan bring to the soul of, an, of a believer? What does he try to get him to do? What has he tried to get him to do ever since the Garden of Eden where he tempted Eve and said, Hath God said? He wants us to doubt the word of God. What if another sincere believer says to you, But I think that God used evolution to create the world. Theistic evolution has been around for a long time, and there are believers who foolishly believe that. Why do they foolishly believe that? They believe that because they don't know anything. They have bought into the lie of the devil, into the lie of the public schools, into the lie of the secular universities, into the lies of the newspaper and the media, into the lies of the magazines that they get into their homes, into National Ge Geographic's lies, one of my former friends used to call it national pornographic because of all the bad pictures in it. They buy into it because they don't know any better. Are they saved? Yes. Will they get to heaven? Yes. Will they get to heaven and the Lord will shake his head at them for what they have refused to learn? I think yes. What about if somebody comes up and says, well, you know, how can you prove that the earth is only 6,000 years old and that evolution could never take place in such a short time? Do you know the good, solid, scientific arguments for that? Dear people, not just the Christians who are being attacked in their faith, but if you want to witness to somebody whose hang-up is evolution, the first thing you have to do is blow their God off of his pedestal and show them it can't work. And then say, now you're in trouble. Because if we've just gotten rid of your God, there's only one other alternative. The God of the Bible. Every pagan religion has evolution at its heart. Did you know that? The word of God makes it clear that there is a creator God. And he is the one before whom someday we will bow. And his name is Jesus. Are you ready to give a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear? How about this? What if someone says to you, well, Genesis only gives us a simple version of creation. It's merely a framework for the creation. An allegory that 
explains the long eons of time that God used to bring it all about. That's called the framework hypothesis. There are Christians out there who are pushing that. How do you answer that person? You go to scripture. How can you prove that's not just a, uh, an allegory? As you go to scripture, how can you prove that that framework hypothesis is rubbish? Do you know how? You should. What if a friend or a child says to you, well, I've heard that the word day, the word yom in Hebrew, in the Hebrew text can also mean a long indefinite period of time. Do you know how to answer that? I hope you do if you were here back in September when I preached on that specific subject and talked about every occurrence of that word in the Old Testament, thousands of them, by the way. I didn't look at every one, but I categorized them for you. Do you know how to answer someone who challenges you with that? Can you get past that argument so you can talk to them about the truth of Scripture? Do you know how to answer someone who does not have your faith or who is wavering in his or her faith? When we cannot give a reason for the hope that is in us, we confirm the unbeliever in his unbelief. We provide a reason for him to harden his heart. When we don't have any answers, we confirm the doubter in his belief that the Bible is a book of myths. Third, we endanger our family and friends that look up to us. Someday they will be faced with those who reject the Bible specifically because of the claims of evolution. Folks, it's all around you. And I mentioned last week, 85% of young people graduating from high school and starting off in college after one year have walked away from their faith. I'm talking about kids who are in church. I'm not talking about all the pagans out there who are already way far out. I'm talking about kids who are in church. 85%. One year into college, walk away from their faith. Do you know why? It is because of the theory of evolution. They can put two and two together. The theistic evolutionists have got their eyes closed. You know, anybody with his eyes open can say, well, if evolution is true, then we don't need God. We're just a blip on the screen. And if we don't need God, and if we're evolved from lower animals, why can't we live like lower animals in our morals, in our ethics, in our struggle for survival, the survival of the fittest? Dear people, this is a critical issue in the church today. And I know I'm taking longer on it than I wanted to, but the reason I tell you this is this is not just my theory. My own children have had to fight this battle going through medical school and graduate school in the scientific disciplines. And they have had to fight this issue over and over and over again and be able to stop the mouths of the gainsayers. And they have had a great deal of training in this subject. When you, or a child, or a grandchild, is faced with that challenge, Will you or they know how to answer it or will you merely be embarrassed and stomp out of the room and let everyone else in the room laugh? We don't have to be arrogant. We don't have to be belligerent. We only have to know the truth. When I was in law school, I had a professor who was a very quiet and gentle man but a very brilliant lawyer. And as we did oral arguments in moot court and things like this, some of the students would get quite loud and quite belligerent about what they were trying to present, the case for their client. And I remember him speaking to us as a group and saying to us, ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to be obnoxious to be a good lawyer. All you have to be is right. Present your case well, and the facts will speak for themselves. And any reasonable judge 
will weigh in your favor. He was a very successful trial lawyer. Now, there are people out there who will refuse to open their eyes or listen with their ears. They will seek to scorn you and mock you. Remember, they did that with Jesus. But you need to be armed with the facts. Dr. Carter's presentation last week on genetics was incredible. As he went through passage after passage of scripture showing how it is a statement of genetics. Do you know those passages? If not, I suggest you go on the internet and, and look at last week's message. It was put up on the internet and it hopefully by now will be in the archives. We encourage you to do that. So as the passages we've just read state, the name of God is declared in creation, as well as the hearing of the ear and the writing of the text. The next way that we saw the name of God declared was on the unveiling of himself to and through his people. God's name is declared by you, not merely in what you say, but in the way you live. I will strengthen them in the Lord, and they shall walk up and down in his name, saith the Lord. Walking in the fear of the Lord declares the name of God to unbelievers, both for good and for bad. God has made us his witnesses to declare his name in all the earth. Jesus said so just before he went up into heaven. Ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Being a witness to God's name requires us to witness to the heathen, the pagan unbelievers around us. Not just to sit in our own little shells and, you know, hope that nobody notices us over here. Oh, Lord, you know, let that guy over there witness to this pagan rather than me. Don't let that pagan see me because, after all, he might ask me a question. Dear people, for good or for bad, we are his witnesses. Listen to what... We read throughout the Old Testament, Therefore I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen. I will sing praises unto thy name. Where? It's among the heathen. Therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and sing praises unto thy name. The first one was in Second Samuel. The second reference I just read was in Psalms. First Chronicles says the same thing and say, Save us, God, of our salvation, and gather us together, and deliver us from the heathen, that we may give thanks to thy holy name and glory in thy praise. Save us, O Lord. Here's another one from Psalms. Gather us from among the heathen to give thanks unto thy holy name and triumph in thy praise. We declare the name of God among the heathen. Why do you think God put you here on earth? Just so you can have fun for 70 or 80 or 90 years or maybe 100 years if you live a long time. Why did God put you here among all those heathen? It is so that you can declare his name. That he is the creator, he is the savior, he is ultimately the judge. And we discover that that is the third way in which God declares his name among the heathen is in announcing his mighty presence through judgment. In Psalm 71, to the chief musician al a psalm or song of Asaph, Unto thee, O God, do we give thanks. Unto thee do we give thanks, for that thy name is near thy wondrous works. Declare, when I shall receive the congregation, I will judge uprightly. Listen to verse 3. What kind of judgment? Some kind of a, a petty little thing, a slap on the wrist? Listen to verse 3. The earth and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved. Peter makes reference to that over in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and following. In verse 10 and 11 he says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements, by the way, that's a statement of scientific fact. That's the word from which we get our word Adam. The elements. God has declared even something about the sub- visible particles of which we are made, the atoms.
that compose all things. God is giving us a statement about nuclear physics. Because he said the atoms are going to be dissolved. They're going to be broken up. What happens when you split an atom? You have an atomic bomb. Dear people, that was long before they knew anything about atomic bombs. God revealed something to us that we only found out in the 1900s. You know, as you study scripture, it gives you hints as to what you can look for. Like clues that are out there so that God's people can be the forefront leaders in science, which they were. For several hundred years, it was believers who were the leaders in science and made all the basic scientific discoveries. And suddenly, within the last 50 years, we have this turning inward pietism whereby we are no longer connected with our responsibilities to the world around us through the creation that God gave so that we can demonstrate his power and glory. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? All these things shall be dissolved, Second Peter 3.11. Asaph in Psalm 75, 3, all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved. The earth and all the inhabitants. 2 Peter again, 2 Peter 3, 12, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements, second time he says it in this passage, shall melt with fervent heat. Dear friends, those are scientific statements. And that is what is in fact coming when Jesus comes to judge the earth. He declares his name through judgment. Dear friends, do you care about your friends and neighbors? Do you care whether or not they're going to come under that judgment? Does it not motivate you to want to try to answer their questions so you can reach them for Christ? Back to Psalm 75. The name of God declared in judgment, but verse 7. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. This is in the context of declaring the name of God in the first verse. Down in Psalm 96. Pour out thy wrath upon the heathen that have not known thee, and upon the kingdoms that have not called upon thy name. You know what that is? Before, we've seen sins of commission. They've done these evil things. And so God, because of his holy name, is going to judge them. Here is a sin of omission. The kingdoms that have not called upon thy name. And what's going to happen to them? Pour out thy wrath. The name of God is declared in his judgment even for sins of omission as well as for sins of commission. Psalm 102.15, So shall the heathen fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth thy glory brings us to the book of Revelation where that same psalm is cited fifth God declares and defends his own name so that it would not be blasphemed we gave an illustration of that last week we'll not go through all the passages dealing with it but we're back on track here now Sennacherib and Ravshak in the days of Hezekiah and Isaiah they had blasphemed the name of God in heaven and God defended his name by killing 185,000 Assyrians in one night to defend his own name. We saw that for the Christian it's a matter of living out our faith so that God's name will not be blasphemed. Thou that makest thy boast of the law, you think you know the Ten Commandments? You think you're doing pretty good obeying them? Through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. Is the name of God being blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you? We saw that it affects practical life in terms of the home. Speaking to the women to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. James chapter 2, talking about paying special attention to the rich people and ignoring the poor people. 
Do they not blaspheme that worthy name, those rich people, by the which ye are called? Dear people, the way we live either brings glory to Christ or it causes blasphemy to his name. In the New Testament, we find our Lord Jesus Christ speaking after the resurrection in Luke chapter 24. And as they thus spake, the disciples being gathered together, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and, and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and of an honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, And thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Now listen. Verse 47. I gave you all of that ahead of that. So you'll understand the context in which Jesus says this. It's after the resurrection, shortly before the ascension. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. Repentance and remission of sins. You understand that if evolution is true, then there is no historical Adam. There is no historical Eve. If evolution is true, the serpent, that old serpent the devil, as the scripture calls him, did not tempt Eve. If he did not tempt Eve, Eve never ate of a forbidden fruit. She was deceived, the New Testament tells us that. But it also makes it clear that Adam walked into it with his eyes wide open. And if there is no forbidden fruit of which Adam partook, there is no fall. If there is no fall, Adam did not die spiritually at the moment that he ate of that fruit. Sin did not enter into the world through one man, which is declared for us clearly by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans 5 verses 12 and verse 19. If there is no fall... Adam was not a sinner, and none of his progeny were sinners. If there is no sin, either sin nature or acts of sin, man does not need to be redeemed from sin. And Jesus Christ becomes irrelevant. Do you understand why Satan wants to blind believers on this issue, make them stumbling along, not knowing what's going on? Why he wants to pervert the minds of the children and grandchildren of believers? Why he wants this philosophy to take over society? Because if there is no sin, then anything goes. And we see the horrendous wickedness that surrounds us 
today. Oh yes, we see it in abortion and euthanasia and in adultery and fornication and multiple marriages, which God says is the same, and in sodomy and lesbianism. And dear people, I just got this week the newspaper that John McKnight used to publish. And there are things that are now legal in Sweden, bordellos with animals, which are legal in Norway and Sweden and several other countries. You see, if man is not a sinner, it doesn't matter what he does. But if man is a sinner, God showed us his great love at Christmas when he sent his son, his only begotten son, in human flesh, that he might die on Calvary's cross and pay for our sins. Do you understand that's why Jesus came? John 1.12 but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Do you understand that that's why the last chapter of the book of John is written? And it explains to us why it was written. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life. Listen to the last three words. It's our theme. Through his name. And that believing ye might have life through his name. God created physical life at the beginning. God creates spiritual life in those who will trust in Christ alone for their salvation. Acts 4, 11 and 12. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner, the cornerstone. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the ineffable name of our Lord Jesus Christ. How we thank you for that name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of of God the Father. Father, I pray that if there was someone here today who does not know Jesus Christ as his or her personal Savior, that they might realize that Jesus is their Creator. He's the God of heaven. He is both God and sinless man in one person. That he bore their sins on Calvary's cross. And that he was buried, proving he was really dead. And the third day he rose from the dead, proving that his promise of eternal life is true. To those who trust him alone. Not trusting him plus their good works. Or trusting him plus their money. Or trusting him plus their church membership. Or trusting him plus their baptism. Or trusting him plus their confirmation. Or trusting him plus all the stuff that they've done all their life. Jesus alone, there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Cause that person even now to in his or her heart say, Father, I have sinned and fallen short of your glory. I know that your word declares that Christ came into the world to save sinners. I know that someday if I am not saved, I will have to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ as my judge. 
And right now I'm trusting in Jesus to save me. Father, there may also be here someone who doesn't really have confidence in your word as it is written, that you are the creator God who made all things that are in heaven and in earth, that at the creation you did it as the text declares in six literal days and rested on the seventh. Oh, Father, we pray that you will cause such a person, even now, to say, I will find out the truth. I will study the creation as the scripture commands me to do, that I might know more about this amazing God who made me and all things. Father, we pray that you will take your word as it has been proclaimed today that you will use it in our hearts, give us understanding, and give us joy as we look forward to the great promise of our Lord's return. If none of these things in the past were literal, how can we expect anything in the future to be literal? But because we believe your word and we see it as clearly demonstrated to us. Indeed, Father, we know that Jesus might come back even this very day to catch up those who know him and so shall we evermore be with the Lord. And for this, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.